So welcome colleagues, welcome colleagues, if you're joining us online and or if you are here at uh, International House at the home of the IAS. My name is Marcia Meskimen. I'm the director of the IAS. We are about to begin our launch tonight, which is a very exciting um, event. We have, um, I'm going to do a, one item of housekeeping, which is if you are joining us online, we are monitoring questions and um, through the Q&A as well as through the chat. So do feel free to feed in and we'll make sure that your comments are put um, to the speakers tonight. So do not have any worry about that. You are very much welcome and very much part of the event. Um, the other thing I want to say is that we have one uh, online um, uh, speaker. So we will be again, welcoming Barrett um, and introducing Barrett, although you will not um, meet Barrett in the room yet. And um, that will be a, a, a kind of hybrid session uh, at the end of the event. Um, and we have one filmed introduction. So we've not complicated technology in the, in the beginning of this event, but I'm gonna to turn to the filmed introduction, which is really a message that has come from our Pro Vice Chancellor for Research here at Loughborough University. We really wanted to be able to say something about this launch. And then we will start the formal introductions to today's session. But if I can turn first to Dan Parsons, our PBCR. Hi there, my name is Daniel Parsons. I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation here at Loughborough University. And I'm really sorry I can't be with you today for, for this event, but absolutely delighted to record this, this video message of a welcome to, to the event. Um, I'm delighted that the Professor Richard Jackson can, can join us um, to give um, a, a lecture as part of the, the, the IAS um, uh, and to talk us through um, his views on the challenges of pacifism and non-violence in the 21st century. So, 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 so quite a big topic um, that I'm sure, I'm sure that will be a tour de force um, uh, I, I momentarily once I've, once I've finished talking to you. Um, it's also fantastic that we um, were able to launch a new journal um, through this, this connectivity um, at, at Loughborough and the IAS and being able to support this um, uh, piece as well with, with, both, um, with, with both Professor Jackson and, and Dr Gray. And, and I think it's just a fantastic um, uh, projection piece uh, for, the, for, for, for us as a university to be in these debates and to be working and, and, and furthering um, some of the outcomes that are incredibly poor, important around pacifism and, and non-violence. And, and, and of course, um, you know, this connects with, 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 that, with our University 2030 strategy, which really ambitious strategy about creating better futures together, but being much more ambitious around our internationalization, being much more ambitious around our research and innovation endeavors as well. And of course, these sorts of events and this sort of connectivity and projection into the wider world around us is absolutely central to, to furthering those, those aims. As part of the strategy, we have three, three um, uh, key themes, um, uh, sport, health and well-being, uh, climate change and net zero, and vibrant and inclusive communities. And, and I see all three of those really intersecting again with, with the topic of, of discussion today around pacifism and non-violence. If I think about the global challenges associated with our themes around health and well-being, about addressing climate change in, 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 in a way that is fair and equitable and, and thinking about the intersections of communities uh, and social justice um, across those, those uh, vibrant and inclusive communities of the future that we all hope and, and, and strive for. Those all connect into this, this um, set of issues around passivism and nonviolence. And of course, as I'm recording, um, this this um, this message to you right now. Um, the 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 atrocities um, in in Israel and the, the the repercussions of of the the intersections of of of, of that conflict um, is a, a, a reverberating um, around the world. Uh, and of course, you know, pacifism and nonviolence challenges to think about different ways of of organising our societies and and addressing our challenges. And I'm very much look forward to hearing about the outcomes from from the um, from the work and that you're doing and um, from the, the 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 lecture and and the journal as it moves moves forward. And 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 uh, I uh, anticipate with with great strength into the future. So I look forward to catching up to how well everything went. Again, apologies, I can't be there with you, 
but um, I hope it all goes um, very well indeed. So thank you once again and, and bye for now. So thank you very much. Um, in absentia, Dan, um, I'm not going to, uh, at the risk of having a million introductions and never getting to the talk, um, I just want to say a couple of things from the IAS. Um, I want to echo Dan's welcome to Richard Jackson from the University of Otago. Um, and um, we are absolutely delighted to have Richard live with us. We have also seen Richard online as part of this project earlier um, in this season, and it was really fantastic then. And so we are really thrilled for, um, about that today. And also to be welcoming um, live Dr. Felicity Gray of Nonviolent Peace Force. And again, it's been fantastic to talk to you. And um, we are thrilled that you're here. But we're really also very, very pleased that um, Barrett Leesman uh, de Guevara could join us online um, uh, Barrett and Felicity have um, co-edited the second issue of, of the journal, and so they're going to be talking a bit about that together. So thank you all three for being here with us today. Um, it goes without saying that the IAS is absolutely honored to host this launch today um, and to be a venue, if you like, that allows some of the debates at the center of this journal to be engaged both in a kind of intellectually transdisciplinary but also sensitive international and transcultural way. And this journal really represents everything that is the best of the IAS. Um, but my comments actually are going to be about Alex for a moment, my colleague, because Alex is immensely modest and will not sing his own praises. So I'm going to do a bit of that, I'm afraid, today. So Alex Christianopoulos, my colleague, um, is the general editor of this, uh, um, uh, the Journal of Pacifism and Nonviolence. And he first approached the IAS during COVID with this idea, this kind of slightly wacky idea that he would launch this journal. And he asked if we could possibly help him support bring, bringing an amazing cohort of um, incredible scholars from around the world together to look at this. And would we be in any way interested in that? And of course we bit his hand off and <laughs> we couldn't have been more interested, um, but your modesty is, is only kind of paralleled by your exceptional scholarly um, activity and also your collegiality. And over the course of the last sort of 18 months in bringing this together, um, you've hosted over 23 extraordinary scholars for the IAS, and we are so delighted that we can be part of this. And so now, rather than the production of this, we have the launch. So congratulations, Alex. Welcome, Richard. Welcome, Felicity and Barrett. Thank you so much for being here to celebrate this. I hope it is a real celebration. Alex, over to you. Thank you, Martha. I um, try and come out from hiding um, in embarrassment, but you know, thank you. I, th I thought I'd say just a few words uh, to introduce the journal before uh, I introduce Richard and then uh, Barry and Felicity a little later on. The chronology of the journal is that it, it began slightly before my getting in touch with the IAS uh, with uh, an email communication with Richard, precisely asking whether uh, he thought that there was scope for a journal like this. And he basically encouraged me to, uh, to explore the idea, to canvas views. So from there, I kind of drafted a, a rationale and um, a, a rough idea for a journal remit, started contacting people uh, all around the world. And to my surprise, almost every single expert that I contacted said, this sounds great, you have my support. The only maybe two who didn't only said so, it, it, they moved on, their research was moving to sort of slightly different areas, but they were supportive. Um, over time, we managed to also secure a great publisher with uh, Brills. We're really gl uh, glad that, um, that, that they support this because uh, quite a few other publishers said that they like the idea, but they're not commissioning new journals at the moment, given the way in which the publishing world is, 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 is developing. But from then on, yes, the IS has been extremely helpful. We organized a, a workshop with all the editors um, a couple of years ago, a kind of transcontinental live workshop from 9 a.m. to 11 p.m. UK time. I don't recommend that in terms of work life balance long run, but it was great to be able to connect to people all around the world live at the same time. So we repeated that uh, last year on, on a, for a three day workshop to generate papers that are coming through uh, the journal at the moment. We also organize three uh, uh, pairs of seminars that are, are still available online for those who, who want to listen to them, um, all uh, with IAS support. So I'm very grateful to the entire IAS team uh, for that, including those hiding uh, behind their computers there and making sure that the, the tech is working. 
We've also had the support of the School of Social Science and Humanities with this. So uh, earlier in the year, we organized a, a sandpit on pacifism and nonviolence to, to see who had any interest in that topic. And in, you know, to my surprise, maybe I shouldn't be surprised, about 20 colleagues are interested. So we're looking at setting up a research group locally for this. But that's in terms of Loughborough. Um, along side, the journal has now taken off. We have two issues. Uh, the first issue was published in March. It was um, a, a set of contributions articulating why now is the time, if ever there needed to be a time, to study pacifism and nonviolence. We have 10 uh, excellent contributions from different angles there. We have uh, our second issue out only a couple of weeks ago on unarmed civilian agency, which we'll talk about a bit later on. But I also want to say, you know, so I think we, um, we've got um, several papers coming through, two are out, a third is coming out tomorrow, the day after, several others in the pipeline. But to illustrate the, the sheer multidisciplinarities that we have wanted all along, among the papers that are out, uh, one is focused on terrorism studies, another is more historiographical, one locates itself in leadership studies, there's one that is um, sort of serious analytic philosophy coming through, as in uh, of the type that you have to sort of read slowly to follow, uh, but really interesting. And uh, in the pipeline, we have um, a forum, uh, so a discussion involving a, a number of authors reflecting on Andreas Malm's How to Blow Up a Pipeline, which is an interesting book that's you know, even generated a film these days. Um, so that's uh, sort of watch this space, something that, that that's in the pipeline. We've got um, a special section or a special issue to be decided on pacifism, nonviolence, and Islam. So again, uh, it gives you a sense of the multidisciplinarity and indeed another um, special section or special issue there's a workshop for coming in May on the economics of pacifism and nonviolence. And so we really are keen, even though we're based in politics and international relations, many of us, to keep this as multidisciplinary as possible. So here's a call uh, for anyone out there. If you're interested in, um, in pacifism and nonviolence in whatever discipline, get in touch if you're not sure or have ideas about potential forums, special issues, or, or even papers, get in touch. But that's in terms of the journal, and that's all I wanted to say on that front. Let me now introduce Richard, who will give uh, the keynote, and then I'll introduce Beric and Felicity a bit later on. I'm really delighted that Richard could join us from New Zealand. Richard is a leading thinker chair in peace studies at the University of Otago. He's the founding editor and current editor-in-chief of the journal Critical Studies on Terrorism, which has produced excellent research and has helped establish that area of research, which might be why he didn't necessarily want to be leading uh, another journal and, and is quite happy to be on the editorial board of it, which I'm delighted he is. He's also the series editor of the Routledge Critical Terrorism Studies book series, and he's the author and editor of 14 books and over 100 journal articles and book chapters, and he's a member of the Journal of Pacifism and Nonviolence editorial board. That's by way of introduction. Um, he's going to talk to us about the challenges of pacifism and nonviolence in the 21st century. So um, over to you, Richard. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, my sincere thanks to the Institute of Advanced Studies and the kind people there for um, making all the arrangements and hosting me for this visit. I've, I've really enjoyed it so far and I, it's an honor for me to be here. Um, but also congratulations Alex, um, this is such a wonderful achievement, and I'm so happy to be here at the launch. Uh, having started a journal, I know how hard it is, and you are to be highly commended, you and the team, for bringing this to fruition. Um, and I know that, you know, with you and the team at the helm, it's going to be a great success, and I wish you well. Um, I don't have a lot of time, so I just want to briefly talk about some of the main reasons why this is an ideal uh, moment to launch a journal on, on pacifism and nonviolence, and also, yeah, broadly, just uh, why pacifism and nonviolence should be taken much more seriously at this moment of history. Um, I did write an article about this in that first issue. Um, so yeah, you can, you can read the arguments in much more detail there, but in this talk, I wanna go a little bit beyond some of those things. Um, in my article, I began by noting that, you know, at the broadest level, this is a, a, a good time to be doing this because there are a, a multiple set of interlocking crises facing the world, the climate crisis, the inequality crisis, the global health crisis, the social justice crisis, um, and so on. 
And I think these crises are revealing the anachronistic and redundant nature of the old political order, um, particularly in terms of its reliance on military-based forms of security uh, and kind of the politics of domination, control, um, and, and security. At the same time, this old order is facing an ever-expanding set of epistemological challenges to its dominant paradigm rooted in realism, coloniality, and securitization. Different theoretical perspectives uh, around decoloniality, feminism, critical race theory, anarchism, environmentalism, and so on, uh, are making in inroads into that paradigm. So I think the current global moment represents an incredible opportunity to rethink dominant beliefs about war, violence, nonviolence, peace, social justice, power, politics, ethics, democracy, ecology, militarism, nuclear weapons, and many other topics. And these are all concerns that are central to pacifism. But beyond this broad context of a global order that's in transition, I wanna briefly talk about a few um, key reasons why uh, taking pacifism and nonviolence seriously uh, is the right thing to do at the current juncture. First and foremost, in the context of the horrific events currently taking place as we speak in Israel and Palestine, as well as in Ukraine, um, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, Sudan, DRC and elsewhere, it seems obvious that pacifism and nonviolence has a great deal to offer in thinking about how we break out of these terrible cycles of violence and how to safeguard civilians and states from future outbreaks of violence. The violent conflicts in Palestine and Ukraine in particular demonstrate what pacifist scholars and others have argued for many decades, namely that violence is an ineffective tool for resolving conflicts. It's also an ineffective tool for creating security or for exerting power over opponents. And its empirical record of achieving either strategic or political goals is rather dismal. In fact, the problem I would argue goes even deeper than this. Violence cannot actually be a tool because its use is always and inevitably constitutive. It inscribes and creates social reality. This is what we've learned from social theory. Actions are prefigurative and constitutive of reality. They make the future worlds we live in and shape our way of being. In terms of violence, militaries, weapons, and war, this creates a world defined by and shaped by militaries, weapons, and war. In other words, a self-fulfilling prophecy or what IR long called the security dilemma. And in Palestine and Ukraine, we can see these dynamics playing out uh, where we're witnessing the failure of previous violence uh, and the abject failure of current military violence to achieve anything except destruction and the seeds of new violent conflicts in the future. In fact, surveying the historical record and the growing number of scientific studies which demonstrate the failure of violence, the late Dustin Howes, a renowned scholar of pacifism, concluded, and I quote, the weight of extensive empirical evidence demonstrates that the practitioners of violence are more often the tragic idealists than are pacifists. In other words, it's not the pacifists who are naive for thinking we should try and resolve deep political conflicts nonviolently, Rather, it is those who think such conflicts can be solved with a show of force who are the dangerous idealistics, uh, dangerously idealistic and naive. In such a context, new and brave thinking is required and deeper objective analysis of the consequences and effects of violence and militarism are called for as pacifism and nonviolent studies is focused on doing. A second directly related reason why pacifism and nonviolence should be taken seriously at the moment is because, as we've noted about the current horrendous violence, much of it directed at civilians, just war theory, the preeminent and institutionally and culturally dominant ethical framework today, has risibly failed to regulate international violence or prevent the outbreak of conflict. I mean, certainly it would be, it was designed for exactly the current situation in Gaza a military assault by a state on an armed group in the midst of a civilian population, but it appears to be having little to no effect at all. There are a lot of reasons why just war theory was bound to fail, 
But the fact is that violence is uncontrollable in its enactment and unpredictable in its effects. And there's probably no theory or doctrine that can regulate it properly. The point is that at this moment, when just war theory's failures are on display, it's time to consider alternative ethical frameworks, such as that from pacifism, which is based on a proper appreciation of the means ends connection, recognizes the prefigurative and constitutive nature of social action, starts its theorizing with the inherent vulnerability, dignity, and humanity of every human, including those one is in conflict with, and prioritizes caution, experimentation, and the reversibility of action over the irreversibility of violence. A third reason, which I've already kind of alluded to for taking pacifism seriously at the current moment is that the complex security challenges the world is facing cannot be met through military force securitization or the current war paradigm. And this includes all the things I'm, I mentioned, um, you know, climate change, social justice, health, and so on. Another more prosaic reason for taking pacifism and nonviolence seriously is that the same issues which animate IR are also central to pacifism, such as questions around war, violence, force, power, security, peace, order, justice, militarism, law, humanitarianism, peacekeeping, agency, and so on. Another prosaic reason for taking pacifism and nonviolence seriously is, is that it's in fact already played a historic and highly influential role in the history of international politics. Pacifism has had a lasting empirically verifiable impact on among other things, international law, disarmament, anti-war movements, international organizations, uh, as well as a large number of nonviolent resistance movements during the period of decolonization, the end of the Cold War, and the more recent Arab Spring. Now, these mass movements have profoundly shaped the evolution of the international system and the conduct of international politics. And, an, and a historical assessment of IR would also have to acknowledge the lasting influence of key historical figures associated with pacifism and nonviolence, including Tolstoy, Gandhi, King, Sharp, and others. And then finally, we, I think we have to acknowledge the rise of nonviolent resistance movements and urban insurrections in the past few years, which continue to shape the dynamics of international and domestic politics, including the Occupy movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, the climate change movement, and a huge number of urban insurrections and nonviolent resistance movements in numerous places like Hong Kong, Thailand, Sudan, Bolivia, Brazil, Turkey, Greece, Sri Lanka, and many more. In many of these movements, importantly, we can see creative attempts to develop new forms of political power rooted in radical democracy, equality, and collective action. In addition, there are numerous indigenous peoples movements who have been modeling alternative forms of politics, community, and protest for many, many decades. Now, such movements and events require investigation and engagement as they relate directly to pacifism's concerns with the nature of power, the role of human agency, and bottom-up community-based alternatives to violent forms of politics and state domination. In other words, there are a lot of good reasons that now is a good time to be thinking about and talking about pacifism and researching it and teaching it, and a great time for the launch of a journal on it. Nevertheless, Despite these obvious intellectual relevance uh, and the, yeah, the relevance of pacifism and nonviolence as a framework for research and teaching about contemporary politics and IR, um, there are a number of difficult challenges facing the field at this time. Um, and I don't have time to go through all of them, but he here are just a few. First and foremost, I think pacifism and nonviolence is what we might call a subjugated knowledge. It's a form of knowledge and practice that is mostly ignored in our educational system, our media, and our political discourse. Sometimes it's actively derided and su suppressed, and it's subject to a series of stereotypes and myths which make it appear naive, unscientific, irrelevant, and even dangerous in some views. As such, it belongs to those theories and approaches which exist on the margins of the disciplinary field, 
such as feminism, post-colonialism, anarchism, environmentalism, and so on. There are therefore challenges to be overcome in giving it credibility and highlighting its genuine relevance. In large part, this marginality is a consequence of the entrenched militarism and cultural myths of our societies, which shape our relationship to war and violence, what can be called the cultural hegemony of war. Due to immersive cultural conditioning, the social attitudes to pacifism and nonviolence are refracted through the reflexive and effective pull of violence. As Chris Hedges put it, war is a force that gives us meaning. When this effective pull is combined with and co-constituted by the cultural myths of war, pro propagated every single day by virtually every single social institution, the media, sports, education, religion, politics, what Michael Billage might have called banal militarism, this inevitably reduces pacifism and nonviolence to a marginal status. In other words, there are an array of social forces vested in the continuation of militarism and the cultural hegemony of war who will resist any and all efforts which they see as questioning, delegitimizing, or devaluing continued militarism and war. The war system is lucrative for some, and it's a very useful tool for others. It has a number of important social functions in the current order. Pacifism would threaten the continuation of the system, and it will therefore face a great deal of resistance, which this field must learn to navigate. Now, this point will inevitably be controversial, but I believe the current round of violence in Israel-Palestine, from one perspective at least, raises the tricky question of revolutionary violence by oppressed people, particularly when nonviolent resistance and avenues for social justice are blocked. A few years ago, after a talk that I gave on pacifism, a colleague asked me whether pacifists would condemn the terrible violence of slave revolts, such as those in Imperial Rome or the Southern states of the US, or indeed the Haitian revolution in 1804. Given what we know about the absolutely unspeakable and totalizing violence of slavery, the answer seemed clear. And writers like Franz Fanon and James Baldwin have further opened our eyes to the destructive and corrosive anti-human violence of colonialism. And I have personally witnessed the terrible inhuman conditions of life for those who suffer under apartheid political systems, exactly what the Palestinians are currently living under. When human beings suffer such totalizing, dehumanizing, humiliating, and life-diminishing violence, and when all their pleas and nonviolent protests for social justice are denied and blocked, is violent revolutionary resistance legitimate? And if so, what does this mean for our normative and analytical attitude to the question of resistance and social change? Martin Luther King Jr. argued that sometimes a crisis, such as the one produced by a violent act, or as he would have preferred it, a mass nonviolent uprising, is necessary to reveal the underlying suppressed conflict in society so that it can be addressed. This question has even greater re resonance today because a sober review of history has to acknowledge that in some contexts, pacifism and nonviolence has been employed as a tool of domination against the press groups struggling for their liberation. In the case of Palestine, for example, a great many peace activists and international actors have insisted for decades that Palestinians confine their struggle to nonviolent actions, even when such actions have proven futile and have been met with ever increasing violence, worsening conditions, continuing dispossession, and even the delegitimization of nonviolent protest itself, such as current efforts to outlaw the BDS movement. It is an embarrassment when Westerners ask, where is the Palestinian Gandhi? knowing full well that they are probably all dead or languishing in an Israeli jail. I believe that this particular case in which people living under an oppressive apartheid system who have had every nonviolent option systematically blocked poses a serious challenge to the way we think about pacifism and nonviolence. And we will need to work through its implications for our theory and practice, lest we risk being a tool of oppressive power. Beyond Palestine, 
as the climate justice movement also moves into a more confrontational phase of its struggle against an entrenched economic and social st structure addicted to oil, the question of direct action, blowing up a pipeline, for example, will become relevant. And of course, there are other oppressive situations where such questions will need to be answered. Actually, this question about revolutionary violence is related to a whole series of other very tricky questions about the nature of violence itself. What exactly is violence? And is there such a thing as nonviolence? In recent years, I believe we've learned a lot more about how structural violence, for example, kills and harms more humans than the direct physical violence of war and terrorism. How cultural and epistemic violence harms humans psychologically, emotionally, and spiritually and can result in the daily institutional and micro-violences of racism, patriarchy, ableism, classism, and other forms of prejudice. How human activity harms the natural world, the environment, other species, and the climate, and so on. Understanding these myriad forms of violence, which are embedded in our social systems and cultures, suggests that acting non-violently is in fact no easy task and it will require different approaches in different contexts and really clear thinking about what it is we're trying to achieve. It will be a challenge to the field to work through the implications of these new understandings of the nature of violence and how, how exactly we can act consistently in our own nonviolence. A somewhat related issue which faces this new field, and I think all fields in the current academic system, is the inherent Eurocentrism and coloniality of knowledge. In particular, pacifism, although influenced in part by Gandhi and Eastern religious traditions, derives much of its theoretical foundations from European experiences, European scholars, language, and political philosophy. There are real challenges to be faced in decolonizing pacifism and nonviolence, and bringing to the fore non-European and non-Western scholars, experiences, terms, traditions, and philosophies. In some cases, pacifism in other parts of the world might not even have the same language. So how do we deal with that? And then lastly, I just want to mention that we've witnessed in recent times the employment of non-violent resistance and non-violent movements for distinctly illiberal purposes and goals. This also poses an ethical and normative challenge to the field, as well as an empirical analytical challenge. One key question is, how do we try and ensure that what we learn about the success of nonviolent movements doesn't get taken up by illiberal govern governments, sorry, illiberal movements, or indeed by the state when it's trying to counter nonviolent resistance? Uh, and there's a key question there that we need to face. So just to conclude, I, I hope you're not too depressed or dismayed uh, by this set of challenges facing the field. They are significant. I mean, I'm not, I'm not depressed. Uh, not only is every challenge also an opportunity to grow and learn, but to quote Romain Roland and later Antonio Gramsci, we need to go into this with the attitude of pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. The challenges are real and large. We must not shrink back from them or minimize them, particularly at a global moment uh, when we're facing such a, a horrible, violent situation uh, and we need to be able to say something. Instead, we must fortify our will and our determination and apply all of our intellectual abilities to try and meet these challenges. So with that, I commend the journal to you and Alex and his team, and I wish you all success, and I thank you all for the listening. Yeah. Right. Um, so thank you, uh, Richard. Um, you can all see hopefully why I'm delighted that Richard is part of the project. I should have said before, this is a team project, it is a team effort. I'm grateful to you know, 14, 15 of us, or colleagues rather on the board.
book as well as in particular uh, Ned Lobos and Molly Wallace, uh, the co-editors of course as well. But that leads me to also express uh, gratefulness to the three guest co-editors uh, co of uh, the special issue, that is issue 1.2. They will tell you uh, better about it than myself. So uh, Jeremy Alush isn't with us today, but Berit, Blizzard uh, de Guevara and Felicity Gray are. Uh, Berit is Professor of International Politics at Aberystwyth University. She founding editor of the Center for the International Politics of Knowledge, which is the principal investigator of a two million pound AHRC GCRS network plus creating center for spaces uh, project. Before joining Aboriginal in 2012, she held academic positions in Germany, Sweden, and the UK. And she is one of the three guest editors of uh, the second issue of the journal on unarmed civilian agency in armed conflict. But I believe she will speak after Felicity. Uh, Felicity is the current global head of policy and advocacy for nonviolent peace force. She has previously worked for a nonviolent peace force as a startup director in Ukraine and a steam leader in Bentiu, uh, South Sudan, the largest displacement camp in the country. In addition to her experience as a practitioner, Felicity is also an academic and expert in unarmed civilian protection, and she too was one of the uh, guest editors of uh, the journal. Over to Felicity to learn more about unarmed civilian agents. We need to shuffle those online. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us today for this launch, and to Alex and the IAS in particular for the opportunity to be here, um, and also to speak about um, our special issue. Um, it's a pleasure to be here alongside Richard and my colleague and friend Baron to talk about why this is such a critical time for this journal and to be talking about unarmed civilian agency in violent conflicts. So I'm going to speak a bit about the why um, and then Barrett will give you um, a more uh, comprehensive overview of, of our special issue. So I think it's really important, um, though we are here in a university and though um, the journal itself has a theoretical focus, to also remember that um, these are never just case studies. Um, we think about these, these issues and these topics because they have fundamental impacts on the ways that, that people live their lives. Um, and, and pushing back against the tendency to theorize people's lives, which I think is far too evident in our academic world is, is such an important task. And I really commend IAS and, and Alex and the journal for providing a place to do just that. Um, <clears throat> in terms of nonviolence, I think we can all be very clear about the politics of dismissal that often accompanies these debates. And, and it makes it crucial and a, a crucial time to illuminate um, how it is already working, what examples already exist and are being pursued by civilians in this case um, in the world. I think there's a reason that that dismissal occurs and it's in part due to what Richard just referenced that this knowledge, this practice is subjugated. It's not um, centering the state. It's not centering our um, traditional uh, tools of protection. And so it gets sidelined. And when we when we recenter nonviolent knowledges, nonviolent practices, we can learn, I think a lot more about the ways that we can protect one another and the ways that we can pursue peaceful outcomes for communities. So I want to tell a story about um, one of the communities that I worked with in South Sudan and, and how I think this illustrates this um, very well before passing over to Barrett. Um, so if I work in protection and peacekeeping, and if you Google those terms, the first thing that will come up and the first thing that will come up in conversation is the work of armed military peacekeepers for the UN. Pictures of blue helmets, often in a tank, fully kitted up um, with weapons. Um, and that is how that imaginary um, is often constituted. And we have to work really hard to trouble that understanding. In 2009, I was doing research for my dissertation in Bentu, which is, as Alex said, the largest displacement camp in South Sudan, which is a country that has been very impacted by civil war. It's extremely violent. 
But on this day, the violence was actually committed by the armed UN peacekeepers. Um, two residents of that camp died at the hands of military peacekeepers who were trying to separate them in the midst of a fight. And this caused enormous consternation in the community that we worked in. They were very upset that those who said they were there to protect them were the ones that had caused death and further violence. At that time, the UN pulled all of their unarmed uh, personnel from the camp, including unarmed UN police, and left only military presence. They wouldn't get out of their tanks. They weren't talking to civilians. There was very little um, effort to mend and repair those relationships and to try and find a nonviolent um, pathway to repair. The one, the one group that, that was working at this was women's protection teams. At the time, there were four in, in Bentu um, IDP camp. One of the mornings, we, Nonviolent Peace Force, entered the camp to see um, you know, what the situation was. And the first people we saw was a group of women in their visibility T-shirts patrolling around one of the areas of, of the IDP community. And we asked them, you know, how is it going? What are you doing? And they had mobilized in the absence of other protection actors to um, reach out to their community to do conflict media mediation and de-escalation at this critical moment. And I think it really speaks to not only disrupting who we think of as protectors, but also the power of nonviolent agency in such settings and that that expertise is often not found where, where we assume it to be, um, at least in academic conversations. And so this, I think, is one of the examples of those experiments that Richard is talking about, um, these um, examples that disrupt how we think about violence, how we think about nonviolence and what is possible, even in extremely violent contexts. And this is really what our special issue aims to do um, across a lot of different um, contexts that, that Barrett will expand upon. And I just wanted to say as someone who has um, a foot each in the practice camp and the academic camp, um, how grateful I am for spaces like the journal that offer an opportunity to integrate those understandings, um, to draw together theory and practice in a way that I think is very generative um, and to provide more examples of what this can really look like in practice so that other people may too try, try those experiments. So I'll pass on to Barrett to talk more about why it's necessary um, to highlight unarmed civilian agency in violent contexts and how, how our special issue goes about um, trying to be part of that conversation. Thank you, Barrett. Yeah, thank you very much, Felicity. Thank you, everyone. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, sorry that I can't be here, uh, can't be there with you in person. I've just come back from some travels, so I'm glad I made it at all. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Alex, for having us as a first special issue to the journal, because um, the politics of dismissal also means that it's quite hard to place a whole special issue on nonviolence or nonviolent civilian action in a in an existing journal. So our uh, special issue had quite a journey until it arrived at this uh, at this journal, and I think it's really important for the establishment of nonviolence pacifism as a, a relevant field, not a marginalized one, but a central field of studies around international politics, politics, um, sociology, and so on to find kind of a, a home. Maybe with the caveat a little bit to say that we have to also have to make sure that we that we don't remain that circle of friends who talk to each other, but we don't talk to anyone else. So that I, I guess that will be kind of the task for you, Alex, and the team to really get those conversations with others going to expand that field as well. But I think having a journalist is a, is a really great first step. Um, <clears throat> when you introduced me, you mentioned the, the Network Plus Creating Safer Space, which is um, a research network that tries to do exactly what Felicity says, which is to take action that is already out there, nonviolent action by civilians, seriously as a starting point for theorizing, so not come with big concepts, which quite often, as as uh, uh, as we've also heard, have the problem of being kind of this kind of Eurocentric knowledge, but to really see what, so for me, kind of nonviolent civil action is almost like a, a, like a practical critique 
of dominant approaches to to thinking about protection in, in, in violent conflict, for example. So I think this was kind of the spirit that also drove us to think about this special issue, to try to get more people together to speak to each other, also from different fields within um, like pacifism and nonviolent studies more broadly conceived, because again, they're like little, let's say little pockets of people who talk to each other, but maybe not across. <clears throat> so that was important to us. Um, and also to come from those cases and to show that wealth of what is out there um, already and to show how, how we can push that forward. So let me briefly talk you through through the special issue and what you can read there. Um, special issue has five uh, uh, contributions, um, uh, which all look into this kind of idea of how we can put um, kind of push the state of the art of our understanding of civilian agency and violent conflict forward. And there's a first article by uh, Nerf McCasper, who's also one of our co-investigators of the network, who's done research uh, with a, an indigenous community in the Philippines. And um, he looks at um, their politics of creating a peace zone that rejects both violence from the Philippine state and from non-state insurgents as a form of geopolitics. So he doesn't just describe how the space works and how nonviolence in that space works, but he really tries to push it kind of also um, in terms of, of, of concepts. Um, and drawing this idea of indigenous geopolitics really makes the argument um, that there is a logic of both states and insurgents claim to nationwide controls um, that is undermined by this peace zone and its idea of a sort of local level sovereignty that rejects any overarching and competing projects of rule. So I think this is kind of, for me, an example of how this kind of practical critique of dominant concepts here, the state and state-based sovereignty um, uh, can work. So it's a really, really interesting uh, study. There's a second contribution by our co-editor of the special issue, Jeremy Alouche and colleagues from the Democratic Republic of the Congo um, about women's uh, agency. And again, while you might think, okay, there's a lot written about this, um, but really what their article tries to do is to unpack this notion further beyond kind of a binary understanding of, of gendered categories to look specifically at um, the different, let's say, repertoires that women um, uh, in the DRC um, resort to around um, using the notion of cultures of silence and the strategic use of silence as well that women can choose to in certain situations to protect themselves and other women um, from all sorts of violences in the community and the family. Um, a third article is uh, by Molly Wallace, who I think is also on the uh, board of this journal. I've seen her among the attendees of, of the webinar that I'm part of here. Um, so Molly uh, uh, has an article that's called Credible, Credible Messengers, Formers and Anti-War Veterans, Former Fighters as Sources for Violence and War Disruption. And her case study is really interesting because it looks, a, because it looks at the context of the US so quite often when we think about nonviolence, pacifism, we think about violent conflict in the global south, but it's just as important or more important in the global uh, north. And uh, she looks at how, for me, it kind of pushes the understanding of what who we think about when we think about nonviolent civilian agency, because here we have former violent actors who then choose um, to, to contribute nonviolently to uh, undoing kind of cycles of violence. Um, so it's a kind of different type of actor that we quite often uh, overlook. So this is a really interesting article. And basically, um, <clears throat> the, the group she looks at are these um, like former gang members who are now credible messengers um, in the context of gang or, or clique street violence, formers in the context of extremist violence, and also on anti, uh, anti-war veterans in the context of US war efforts. And what I found really interesting about the article is how the former two groups are seen as being very positive as they try to disrupt cycles of violence. Anti-war veterans, by contrast, are rather seen as a... Uh, um, well, suspicious because there's a culture of militarism in the US, which kind of doesn't put them in the same light as these other two groups who, who contribute to nonviolent way, ways of, of addressing violence. So very interesting that one as well. The fourth contribution um, looks at um, partisans, so civilians who support 
violence through indirect support that they give to violent um, groups. So this is a contribution by Shane Barter, and it basically tries to unpack that category of civilians a bit more, to not take them romantically as the kind of nonviolent victims of conflict, or maybe people who have some agency, but like always, always on the side of peace somehow, but really to, to think about civilians in conflict on a continuum from nonviolent action. So for example, refusing to collaborate with armed actors to neutral actions, being there, maybe providing food or medicine or shelter to indirectly uh, violent forms, and then finally violent action. And, um, Basically, the argument here is that indirect forms of, of um, uh, support can also fuel the violence. Nonetheless, it doesn't undermine the status of civilians as civilians. So there's a really interesting um, uh, uh, case here of how to how armed actors and how the state then treats those civilians in war. And then finally, and this goes a bit away from our case studies and in-depth case studies that we just made a, a case for, but I see myself being somebody who works qualitatively and interpretively more and more asking for people to please come up with the UCP and Civilian Protection Database, because it's quite appalling how nonviolence, um, especially in the field of or in, 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 in cases of um, like classic peacekeeping is completely understudied, especially by our colleagues who work quantitatively, because we don't have the database to work with. So there's no data in that's any in any shape or form comparable to the data we have on nonviolent resistance on the one hand, to take something from the field of nonviolence, or about um, armed uh, uh, peacekeeping, so UN uh, peacekeeping, for example, there's a wealth of data and people do studies over and over to show how it works and whether it works and 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 all variations of variables and so on. Uh, we don't have that for nonviolent protective action and violent conflict. And that's a real shame because it makes it like a non-topic in academia. So I think to kind of, yeah, so to end with that, there's an article by Randy Janssen and Mayuel Kaufmann um, who uh, kind of argue that we should have such a database and who outline which kind of learnings from other fields we could draw on to produce such a database and what it could look like and what it should contain. So if anyone is out there who would like to do it, I think they would be very happy to connect. I'm very happy to try to help and find funding, although I'm not the person who will do the quantitative work because that's not my field. But I think it's really, it just goes to show how some some areas about which we work are just so overlooked because some basic kind of um, some basics for research are missing. And in this case, it's really that data that is missing, which might be helped by organizations like Nonviolent Peace Force, but there's no kind of accessible database of that. And I think that's something we need to do. So, yeah, maybe just to to uh, to to finish. I think having the journal is a great step forward to establish this really as a field, as I said in the beginning. And I think there are more things we need to do um, as a community interested to, in establishing uh, nonviolence and pacifism more as a kind of core of what we talk about um, in our respective disciplines and fields. And um, we talked a bit about this at a, at a gathering of um, unanswering protection organizations and self-protecting communities last week in Geneva that um, uh, Felicity and I attended, which includes something like coming up with the maybe a public curriculum, giving more talks about this um i don't know getting some public intellectuals to talk more about nonviolence or whatever it is that i think as a community we have to get together more often and kind of think about kind of proactive ways of undoing some of that militaristic thinking that so much um uh, dominates not only our own uh disciplines but also our own lives so that would be my wish for future meetings among us thank you so much